welcome. Thanks for, thanks for hanging out with me for the next, uh, the next hour or so. Those of you watching, thank you for tuning in. I don't think people tune in anymore, like there's no like analog stuff, but whatever, I'm gonna use it. There will be a number of scenarios where I make up words during the session. I will point out when I think I've made one up, but if you do catch one, please throw something at me. I don't know if we can do that, but throw the soft things, like the little stress balls that you picked up in the vendor expo, everybody's got them. Chuck one of those up here, or don't. Like, please, maybe don't, maybe don't do that. Um, but I'll, I'll start by, by telling you two things. Uh, the first thing is a little bit about sort of the, uh, the journey that we'll take in the session. Obviously, there was, a, uh, there was a description of the session. Hopefully, that's what brought you here. Uh, but we're gonna sort of split things into, into two pieces. The first piece that we'll split it into is we'll start with the story. Of course, the, the migration approach with a mutual cyber arc and, uh, of course, AWS customer. So we'll talk about what went into this migration from fairly heavy on-prem workloads to a, a more hybridized model with a lot of workloads existing in production in AWS. So we'll start with that story. We'll look at the tools that went into place. We'll look at some of the concerns. My hope is that they match with some of your own experiences. So we'll start there. Uh, the second thing we'll go into is, uh, is a little bit more nerdy, and that is looking at how this particular customer has significantly uh, affected CyberArk's roadmap as it relates to new services, one of which uh, we announced only two weeks ago at our impact event right here in Boston. So that's our customer event if, you, uh, if you've not worked with CyberArk. So that's the journey that we'll take. Uh, I don't think we'll take the full hour, but at the end, there'll be plenty of time for questions. So if you got them, we'll, uh, we'll have time to cover it. Um, the second thing I'll start with is just introducing myself. Hi, I'm Brandon. Uh, I, uh, I'm part of CyberArk's field technology office. Uh, so what that means is I get to spend a lot of time uh, helping with CyberArk's technical strategy. A big part of that is our partnership with AWS, not only making CyberArk available within the AWS marketplace, but also building out solutions in the security and identity spaces that help you get more out of the AWS services that you utilize. Uh, that's the technology part. The field part is I'm lucky enough to get to chat with our customers like this one to not only hear the stories of the cool stuff they're building and designing that we had no idea was even possible, but also helping interact and, uh, and make sure that they're getting the most value possible from a security perspective with the least amount of effort. Because what I love more than anything is effortless security, which I think is like, a, it's like an oxymoron, right? Effortless, so try to get as low friction as we can without trying to reinvent the wheel. Uh, if you've not heard of CyberArk or just you want a quick update, uh, chances are if you've got any experience with us going years and years back, you probably know of CyberArk's capabilities around the management of powerful secrets and access. Things like vaulting and rotation, session isolation and monitoring. These are all stuff that CyberArk sort of did when we first came onto the scene over two decades ago. Um, but where we are now is a little bit different, and you saw the prefix of this session, IAM. We're gonna talk about identities and how every single identity matters. Um, some matter differently, but everyone matters. So take yourselves as an example. I imagine you have various roles from being hands-on with the technology and building to overseeing the teams that do it to even being the folks who, uh, who build the policies and design security approach if you're at the executive level. If any one of you decides not to show up to work tomorrow, your organization is going to be affected. Your identity is powerful. Um, I'll give you an example of what I mean by this, and you're seeing the vision here on the back. Uh, some of us, myself as an example, don't have direct technical access into, say, CyberArk AWS deployments. I don't need that. Um, chances are I might, uh, I might do more harm than good. But I do have access to very critical data, CRM information, customer data, stuff like that. So I'm not a traditionally privileged user, but my access is powerful. Same is true of developers who, again, might not have back-end access to infrastructure, whether it's running EC2, they might not have the ability to create new infrastructure in AWS, but they've got access to your source and code repos. Their identities are important. So what I'm getting at here is that when we look at this particular case study and then zoom out into the entire reason CyberArk exists, it's simply to make sure that we're protecting and we're getting the most security with the least amount of operational impact 
to any identity that our organization considers to be special or important, which these days is almost every single one of them. So that's our thing, that's, that's, our, that's our reason for being. Now, to the thing that you came here for, uh, we've, uh, we've got a customer, they, um, they couldn't be here, otherwise they would be standing right here or right there, uh, but this customer is in the financial services uh, industry. Um, we see this a lot, by the way. This story is typically replicated pretty strongly uh, in either actively regulated or traditionally regulated organizations. Finance, uh, insurance, healthcare, even the folks who are looking at critical infrastructure who are finally migrating those workloads into AWS. The actively or traditionally regulated part is important because they tend to want to look at, uh, at security, compliance, and ops impact side by side. Sometimes the ops impact thing kind of goes off the side. So it's one of the things you'll see here is that that was actually in the first and foremost. Something that isn't unique to this organization, but is something we're seeing more even in this regulated space. So they grow significantly by mergers and acquisitions. Um, that was some of the impetus for making the migration and the consolidation of uh, a couple of four, actually, on-prem data centers to moving those workloads into AWS. They were very, very dev heavy. 50 plus developers inside of the first organizational units that they began to migrate. Now I have a question. Any developers in the room here? Any devs? Amazing, I have another question. Oh, fantastic. Another question, any folks who love their developers, who care about their developers, who want to empower the developers, oh, I love to see that. That was the goal of this organization. We must be able to provide a set of common controls so that our developers and of course our uh, ops engineers so that they don't come find us very angrily because we have interrupted their workflows. Again, that operation ability, made up word, but I like it a lot. So they're migrating. Uh, they do have infrastructure, so on-prem they had uh, a good hefty mix of Windows and Linux too, so all of that was looking to be moved to EC2. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the, uh, the ratio in a little bit of lift and shift stuff versus full new cloud development, but uh, the idea was we're going to use a litany of services to move away from traditional infrastructure, even EC2, so the move to more serverless as an example, the move from traditional databases to all the cool native stuff that exists in RDS as an example, it was a cost saving measure, right? That was the intent, right? They, they were tired of supporting the added overhead, not only of the hardware itself in the physical data center, but also of the actual number of engineers needed to support said physical infrastructure. Now, full disclosure, I'm gonna focus a lot on what CyberArk and AWS are doing together. CyberArk interacting with AWS, it's what's on the tin. However, as you heard in the keynotes, and I imagine many, many breakout sessions, this can't happen in a vacuum, right? There are tons of solutions in the AWS marketplace that allow us to deploy common controls. There are even more native services that let us do it. So the idea here is things like strong authentication, as an example, uh, things like uh, policy setting, things like guardrails and control tower that I'll talk about, these are things that you should use regardless of what vendors make up your security stack. So starting with the basics, you saw them during the initial keynote, good ideas, they still apply here. Um, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit, but just know, whenever we start with migrations, if you're going on that route, uh, start with the common controls first. Strong authentication, I can't recommend it enough. Um, now as they were scoping out this migration, uh, what they found was that uh, in terms of time and effort, from an application perspective, and I'll talk more about applications in a bit, so consistency across what I'll call human identities and non-human identities and workloads is incredibly important, but of the 150 applications that they were looking to transition, they could rebuild in the time frame 20%. The rest was lift and shift, so they needed to have a mix of native controls as well as lifted and shifted ones. Uh, what they found was that they also did not want to build their own services to support this. They wanted to limit the amount of folks actually managing these deployments and these migrations. Who doesn't want that, right? Let's rock and roll real quick. Like, let's press a button and then let magic happen. So that's some of the operational benefit that they were looking at this particular transformation. They were also, as we all should be, very, very hip to the concept of least privilege lowest amount of permissions needed to get the most amount of work done without creating additional risk. That's the regulated side of them, of them speaking. So all of these sort of morphed into considerations of 
do we use native AWS controls here? Do we look at folks like CyberArk to help enable us to move faster, to augment or enrich those native controls? So that's kind of the idea behind the whole thing. Now, as they started building it out, they began to look at what I'll call a self-service model. I'm sure there's another way to describe it, but uh, their organization units, they had 25 of them, had the need to spawn new AWS accounts on the fly. So it wasn't like, yeah, we can get by with like three accounts and we're good to go. Teams needed to be self-service because the applications that were being migrated were customer facing. So y'all, they like, they went off the deep end. They didn't start by migrating internal apps. They're like, no, the stuff that our customers interact with every single day that makes us competitive with other similar financial services institutions, these are the ones we're gonna migrate. It's brave, but they were the ones that had the most visibility in terms of, uh, of this approach. Uh, they of course had sandbox environments too, but the big, big deal was customer facing stuff, which is why availability, redundancy became important. You'll see that a little bit later. Uh, they were also very hip to audit as an example. So understanding what was going on inside of these customer facing environments in order to make sure that they were giving the best possible service to their customers. Um, so they looked at things starting with uh, anything that could find in the marketplace, starting with existing solutions like CyberArk that they already had in place. So that was kind of the, the foundation. Now I'll tell you what actually happened. Uh, so as I imagine many, if not all of you know, if we wanna build a self-service model using uh, generated AWS accounts while also providing the appropriate level of least privilege, of course, using AWS control tower is the way to go. So they knew from the get-go that was going to be the answer. In fact, that's the first conversation that we had was how do we get uh, uh, AWS uh, control tower stood up? How can we use CyberArk in order to make that process a little bit easier? And in this case, uh, CyberArk identity was used. So CyberArk can serve as an identity provider, but you can use whatever one you have. You don't have to reinvent the wheel to get something like that working. But uh, using AWS SSO, using a federated access model was a given. I'm sure you're all like, yeah, duh, that's what we're doing too. But it was an absolute given. The cool part here was that automation flows, uh, for instance, using Skim as an example, were, uh, were created in order to allow CyberArk to be the point of generation for the new uh, groups, as an example, uh, with AWS SSO. So we handled that so they didn't have to have like five sources of truth. Centralization was a big part of, of this migration effort. Uh, we also, of course, are federating access using SAML. Uh, leveraging AWS SSO here is another no-brainer, uh, but as they were spinning up new ones, we were creating these processes on the fly. So even today, new account is needed, goes through a very similar process. The creation of the groups using Skim and either CyberArk or their own IDP, as well as the use of guardrails within Control Tower. Again, least privilege is absolutely key here. Uh, they also, of course, were building uh, linked accounts. So they had a management account, which was top tier. That's the one we interacted with. Linked accounts were also being used here with AWS SSO working beautifully, beautifully uh, in this particular case. Um, you might not use a lot of account linking, uh, uh, account linking depending on how your organization is structured, but they do want to make sure that they have a central management plane, control tower, and cyber arc identity made that part happen. So very first thing we're doing, federated access models, right? Lease permissioning as an example, using the cool native stuff that AWS provides with SSO. I imagine you're all doing that. I imagine you've already implemented multi-factor for these types of access models from within your IDP or MFA provider. If you have not, and I'll say it probably one more time, multi-factor is key. Do it, do it, please, please, please. Super, super important no matter what. But this was the structure. They started with the identity. They started in making sure that there was an access model, that it was auditable, that there was some governance on top of it as well, and that more importantly, that it was automatable. Automatable, not a word, that's another made up one there. So then they started thinking, all right, cool. We can now uh, create these accounts as needed on the fly. We can now perform single sign-on and federation. Life is good, we built the linking, it's fantastic. Now how do we take this to the next level? So they looked at it in two pieces, and you actually see some cyberarchy stuff there uh, on the right, as well as the services that they started with, pretty standard infrastructure stuff, whether it's uh, the lift and shift on EC2 or the new build which was happening with, of course, things like Lambda and things like EKS. So the first thing was, okay, we've established a process to sync and create uh, new groups. 
as well as to create roles. We want to establish a least privilege model, but we also want to make sure that we're continuously testing and right-sizing those permissions. Uh, of course, AWS provides some really, really nifty uh, native controls there to allow us to get a full breakdown of what our uh, identity and access management looks like, but the goal here was to take that and do more. And I'll talk about this in a bit, but CyberArk does something we call Cloud Entitlements Manager, which helped us continuously refine the permission sets used, as well as to remove things like unused permissions, to look very specifically at stuff that CyberArk calls shadow admin permission sets. So sets of permissions that on the outside don't quack like they'd be administrative level, but if you combine them in the right way, can actually create some pretty nifty, it's not nifty, it's actually scary. Scary nifty, when you're in security long enough, scary stuff becomes kind of neat to, uh, to, to think of when it's hypothetical, but creating some pretty uh, nifty um, uh, privilege elevation models, that shadow admin permissioning. That's one thing they did to continuously refine the roles and permission sets that were being created. I'll talk more about that in a minute. The other thing was the management of secrets. Right? No matter how we look at it, secrets will exist inside of our, uh, of our production and non-production workloads within AWS. They're gonna be there. Uh, so one of the things they wanted to make sure they were doing was rotating them if they could be rotated, if they were rotatable, if it made good sense to do so. Whether it's a human secret that's hanging out in IAM, as an example, an access key secret key pair, perhaps, or even looking at something like the ultra-powerful organization root account, which probably should have some workflows so that we're only using it in case of an actual emergency and not just using it because it's convenient. So secrets management was a big part of it. It was inside of AWS IAM, of course, right? Managing the ones that could, targeting risk at the very beginning, that was key. Uh, but it also was secrets associated with EC2, as an example. So those Windows and Linux uh, VMs that got migrated to EC2 as part of the lift and shift, they had SSH keys, they had root credentials, they had built-in administrative secrets that needed to be managed. So right-sizing even things like uh, secrets as it related to the infrastructure, not only AWS IAM in this case. So this is kind of how they built it out at a high level. Um, I will dive in and double-click a little bit deeper into the how, uh, but I like the architecture diagram because architecture diagrams are just kind of cool to, uh, to look at. So permissions right-sizing is absolutely key in any migration, in any deployment, no matter what. Uh, you can get by with the roles that you created when you first migrated your, uh, your first production workload into AWS, but if you don't take a look at it, chances are it gets stale. Uh, chances are users might not even have enough access unless you've allowed too much and then we're in a little bit of trouble. So when I talked about the right sizing of permissioning, what I meant by that is let's take a look at all of the entities, human and non-human, within AWS IAM, and make recommendations. Are these over-utilizing permissions? Are they under-utilizing permissions? Do they have that caustic uh, sets of permissions that could allow potential misuse? Obviously, none of our users would do that, but maybe by an outside party, as an example. So being able to see any permission sets that were risky, of course, very, very important, right? Visibility is always key. You can't remediate unless you actually know something is there but then actually taking action. So as part of this deployment, what they used, in this case, Cloud Entitlements Manager for, was to do a continuous analysis of permissioning, and then they hooked it to uh, uh, infrastructure automation, a Terraform, if I remember correctly, in order to allow for automated remediation. So if we've got uh, stale uh, permission sets, stale roles that are being created, actually take action. Sometimes you might want a human, most times you might want a human to take a look before you start changing permissions, in their case, they actually worked into automated remediation, which was possible here. Um, again, there are native controls that let us do this. The idea here is to simply enrich them, to provide more automation, to provide additional visibility, maybe to teams even who might fall outside of the cloud center of excellence. Maybe those audit teams and compliance teams, if we're regulated, who are always asking us questions about uh, whether or not we're doing least privilege or permission right sizing, as an example. So very, very important part. These days, we actually see most, if not all, migrations start here with the visibility stuff, uh, especially if we may have a group that's already got production workloads running in AWS, and now we're sort of sorting everything out maybe a little bit later from a security side of things. 
So that's how, that's how they began, right? Right sizing and visibility into permissioning. The next thing, as I mentioned, was the management of secrets as well as access to. I talked about things like organization root, right? A lot of times that's stored in legit, a physical safe somewhere. Um, there's not a lot of access uh, review as it relates to a physical safe. Uh, yes, Bill, I don't know why his name is Bill, but Bill got the combination, he went and got it. Other times people know this secret or Groot. These are things that can and should be managed. Um, in a, sort of in parallel to permissions right sizing. Can't right size Groot, right? Ultra powerful for a reason, you wanna protect it. Uh, but then, we looked at the rotation of those EC2 instance credentials on top of IAM stuff, so that all happened. We then began to look at things like least privilege, making sure that when you connect to one of those lifted and shifted instances that you don't get full on admin by default. Whether this is done by local pseudoers or group policy or you use a solution like CyberArk provides, doesn't matter. We should have least privilege on our infrastructure, not just on IAM. Again, it's, it's a common practice. I see nodding heads, so we know this. Um, but with the move and the migration to more AWS-centric workloads, there is the notion, of course, of ephemerality when we need infrastructure to, to exist. What I mean by that is there will be cases, there may be cases for you, it wasn't the case for them, but there may be cases for you where you have EC2 instances for lifted and shifted uh, applications that you sort of constructed to not be persistent. Maybe an instance is gonna be around for a week. Maybe it'll be around for a day and you just haven't gotten around to migrating those things to EKS or using serverless. Well, in the case of that, maybe let's not worry about vaulting a secret, but let's instead concern ourselves with access. So this customer was instrumental in helping us see the value of things like just-in-time and ephemeral access models. CyberArk at its core is a security company. It's one of our benefits, it's also, it also causes us to rethink things uh, in, in a number of cases. Um, in this case, if you'd asked us the value of just-in-time or ephemeral access using things like uh, uh, SSH certificate signing or doing dynamic provisioning and deprovisioning on things like Windows EC2 instances, if you'd asked us about it five years ago, I guarantee what we would have said is, yes, it's the most secure way to go. Security, security, security. Reinforces about security, so I'll tell you, we still feel that way. But if we're not having to vault those secrets, if we're concerning ourselves with access for ephemeral EC2, now we're getting operational value. Now we have time to worry about the 3,700 other things that we have as security or IAM practitioners. So just-in-time isn't just about security. I know for very security-focused folks, you're like, well, yeah, it's the most important part of it, but no, it's about operational value too. So they helped us design a solution, we call it dynamic privileged access, which actually does just-in-time to infrastructure, targeting ephemeral infrastructure within EC2, of course, AWS. So standing access, just-in-time access. Emergency, operational. Always look at that consistency model. They, uh, they taught us a very, very clear lesson there. We wanna be consistent, whether it's hybrid, whether it's full cloud, whether it's human, whether it's non-human, whether it's standing, whether it's ephemeral. So consistency should be something you keep in your mind in your migration. So these are the two things that they started with. Right, making sure that we had the IAM permissioning handled, that we got control tower uh, built in an automated way for self-service, making sure we were rotating secrets that could be rotated to. Uh, this also included things like audit, right? Augmenting the existing uh, logs that are present in CloudTrail, as an example, with true actionable data they could ship off to their audit teams and their compliance teams so they wouldn't have to manually create reports and that kind of thing. This model was started with one organization unit, and I think it was, three initial AWS accounts they were noodled with. It is now pushed out to all 25 uh, organizational units, uh, and it's actually providing not only the security value there, but they're not having to worry about what's next on a new acquisition, or they introduce a new service to help them be competitive. Uh, they are still going through the process of migrating those lifted and shifted applications to more serverless, ephemeral models, modders, models within Kubernetes using, uh, using AKS. I'm not sure what the percentage is, but that has been an ongoing process, but the results gave them the security value, they gave them op value too, and they set them up for the future. Now speaking of future, I shared with you one of the things that they helped us to design around just-in-time access models to EC2 in particular. Uh, early in our relationship, even before this project set off, one of the things they told us 
as well as many other customers told us too when we were pitching the idea of ephemeral access uh, to EC2 was, well, why stop at infrastructure? Could we not do the same model to other stuff? For instance, the console, as an example. Get all that good auditing, get all that centralization, but actually expand it to things like console or access with, uh, with the AWS CLI. So we said, yeah, why wouldn't we do that? So this customer helped us uh, design and pilot another service that we call Secure Cloud Access, just-in-time access using, in this case, AWS SSO, but adding some pretty nifty auditing using a browser extension, right? We're not having to deploy infrastructure to do it. We're just doing it with a little browser extension in, uh, in your Chromium-based browser of choice. Uh, so they helped us pilot this as well by asking the simple question of why not more? Now, as I went through this, I imagine, except for the developers, I imagine that many of your minds focused on human identities. People, us, we're all people, even the developers. It's a terrible, terrible developer joke, I, I apologize, but we're all people. Uh, we tend to focus on humans first and foremost. However, as part of this customer's transformation, of course they're gonna be automating stuff, right? That's the whole value of what they've built out in addition to guardrails with, uh, with Control Tower. So early in our, uh, in our partnership with this organization, like literally the beginning, which I believe we started working with them back in 2015, they were also laser focused on making sure that stuff like this, which I don't imagine you would ever let happen, making sure that stuff like this doesn't happen. Hard-coded secrets. Ensuring that these guys don't hang out in our code, make it to a public repository because, hey, people make mistakes, and then, of course, be searchable using, uh, uh, using, actually, all I did here was I just popped onto GitHub, searched for uh, my secret type of choice, and actually found a whole bunch of them. If you wanna play that game, it's a fun one to play uh, if you ever really want to, uh, to see some silly stuff. But again, there are lots of controls that help us not do this, but the idea is that we must be consistent around management of secrets and identities for workloads in addition to humans, for machines so that we don't have Skynet happening, because we all know how that went down. Um, so we wanna make sure we're consistent with machines too. Now, the good news is, uh, this is something that's possible to do. So one of the things they brought to us was, okay, just like with the other stuff, this was years ago, it was the first thing, but just like with the other stuff, we want to reduce the amount of secret sprawl. So AWS, along with many, many other solutions, offer a very serviceable and powerful mechanism to store a secret. But what tends to happen is, you got a secret over here, you got a little secret over there, it's got a whole bunch of secrets over there by this team. The idea is, well, why don't we look at centralizing that model? So we wanna centralize, get visibility, and reduce the number of vaults that we have floating around out there. We also, just like the value I mentioned before, wanna rotate some secrets. A lot of times, if you're a compliance-driven organization, folks might ask you, how often are you rotating the secrets that, uh, that workloads are using? And your answer might be, um, that's a good question. Maybe never but let's automate that so you don't have to build processes to do it. You don't have to design the functions, although it is possible. They chatted about that in the secrets manager session yesterday. The idea was to move as fast as they possibly could using what they already had. Now I'm telling you this because when we look at consistency across identities, it's not just about giving them secrets. It's also about authenticating them. I mentioned before and I told you I'd mention it one more time how important multi-factor authentication is. Humans can do it very effectively. Some folks might feel a little bit differently if they're, uh, if they're on the end of a very aggressive multi-factor policy, but humans have fingers. They can interact with hard tokens or their mobile devices. Humans have fingerprints and eyes so they can use stuff like biometrics. Applications don't. If they do, then we're in that whole Skynet thing that we don't wanna get to. So apps have a hard time proving that this workload is who it says it is. But I have good news. There are options out there that allow us to get these same multiple factors of authentication. Things like using IAM roles, as an example, to authenticate workloads, great, great way to start. The announcement yesterday of leveraging roles outside of AWS was super, super cool because it means this model can more consistently apply to hybrid workloads instead of full cloud. So a solid one 
by AWS for, for building and, and creating that functionality. Uh, but this also includes looking at some native attributes within Kubernetes, running an EKS. Things like pod identity, namespace, stateful set, all little fingerprints. I, I'm so sorry for building that funky mental image of like apps with fingers and eyes and stuff. I've, my bad. But it becomes a fingerprint for our applications to authenticate themselves in order to retrieve those delicious secrets that have now been managed. Again, for this customer, it was one of the earliest things they did, even before they were really thinking about large-scale AWS migration. So they, uh, financial services institution, they actually started with mainframes, believe it or not. So this extended from mainframe stuff to AWS native workflows too. Pretty cool. Um, but the other thing about it is, you can do app uh, authentication all day. You can do Secrets Manager all day. If it sucks for the developers, it is not gonna be successful. That's it, game over. I mean, it might be successful if you're heavy, heavily heavy regulated, but you're losing a lot of the creativity, a lot of the beauty that developers are able to provide. So we need to keep developers happy. How do we do that? It's actually pretty simple. Uh, don't make them change what they're doing. I mean, there's other things you can do to make your developers happy, but that's a big one here when it comes from a security perspective. So don't change your code, right? Use the stuff that already exists. Don't add complexity because, my goodness, there's already enough stuff we've got to worry about. Okay, great. That's a good idea, but let's look at how it can be executed. Uh, so from a secrets management perspective, you can, of course, ask your developers to change code and use APIs. There are tons of APIs available, API calls to secrets manager as an example, uh, use API calls. It'll work. Your developers will get grumpy at you. But you can do it. A lot of solutions offer it. CyberArk offers it as well. But the jam here, at least one jam, is integrating with stuff. If you've got workloads that are uh, being driven by Ansible, as an example, or Terraform, or uh, you've got secrets that need to exist inside of Kubernetes configuration, just update them there. Or hit a drop down and select your vault of choice. Hopefully CyberArk is the point where those secrets live. Big part of the strategy here, for this customer especially, was making sure that they targeted the stuff that we integrated with, and if we didn't integrate with it, they challenged us to go, go more. Again, if you're not using CyberArk, if you've got another vault, follow the integrations. It's a great way to start. But even then, there's a problem, and that problem is we don't know what we don't know. If, say, CyberArk hasn't integrated with a particular uh, platform, then we're in trouble. Not really. So one of the things that we've done, and this customer helped drive us to it, was actually build some open source things that are useful for apps that may be proprietary. You don't want devs to change their code. So use something like Summon as an example. I've got a link to the, uh, the, uh, the repos for this on GitHub in a bit. But use something like Summon in order to, well, grab a secret, stick it in an environment variable so the dev doesn't need to change the variableization within the code. That's nifty. It's a pretty cool migration tool. Or better yet, remove the secret altogether from the application's knowledge. It's something that we call secretless, pretty nifty name. So the app itself has no idea what the secret is, might not even know what the target is, but using an open source broker to allow us to get the database endpoint or the HTTPS endpoint is another cool thing that you can use in an open source capacity to help enable your developers when you begin to broach the notion of securing application identities but there's still something missing, right? Like, you can do all this cool stuff, and it's all really nifty, but I'm willing to bet, willing to bet, I'm not a betting guy, and I don't have much money at all, but I'm willing to bet that when it comes to secrets, chances are you're using AWS Secrets Manager. Because why not? It's already integrated with so many nifty capabilities within AWS, and that's not gonna stop. So, why not leverage this beautiful, beautiful service that AWS provides? Well, that's challenging, though, because if you're storing secrets within Secrets Manager, which you should do, by the way, what if you're asked to rotate? What if you're asked to build some centralization? Because maybe not all of your application workloads have made it to AWS yet. In the case of this customer, they still had stuff chilling out in a hybrid state. Well, wouldn't it be cool if something like CyberArk could just update the secrets inside of Secrets Manager. That way devs are happy because they're using the native tools that exist and the capability that will continue to grow. They don't have to worry about the secret rotation or building the process. 
And that way security is happy because you've got centralization and audit. And so this customer asked us, as many others did, why not just update them for us? So I am happy to say that two weeks ago, with the help of this customer and several others uh, from a design partner perspective, we released, we announced, we haven't released it yet, we have announced uh, Secrets Hub. Uh, Secrets Hub is a service that we've designed to do exactly that hypothetical that I mentioned, to take secrets that are being managed in a centralized vault, in this case CyberArk, and to synchronize them into AWS Secrets Manager. Rotate them using the existing policies. Be as aggressive as you want with the rotation. Maybe not too aggressive, but be as aggressive as you want based on policy or based on security best practices, and then just have us update them for you. Now, the cool part about this is it wasn't just our customers that helped design this. AWS also worked with us too. So they helped us build things out to where you know within Secrets Manager, within the interface, that a secret is being managed by CyberArk. So Secrets Manager is the source of reference. CyberArk is the source of record. This is one of those things that when I look at it now, all I can think of is, why didn't we do it sooner? Seems like a no-brainer, but I'm happy to say it exists. Now, this also extends to things like visibility, right? We talked about those compliance teams earlier. Well, how many things are being rotated and how's our security posture look? So management and update is one thing, the other component of this is also making sure that if there aren't secrets that are being managed, we simply let you know that. So this is something that we're building out based on customer feedback and customer interaction. Uh, now, again, something that we heard our customer on here. So these newer services, things like Secrets Hub, things like those just-in-time and dynamic access models help us level up from a standing access uh, principle and paradigm and allow us to focus our intent on migrating to new AWS services to continuing, build, uh, continuing to build things out based on uh, new acquisitions in this customer's uh, case. Pretty cool stuff, I think. Uh, now, I've got even better news. Um, I hope this story was helpful to you. Again, we looked at a number of different things from how we started to the first things we began to look at from an identity perspective to then getting into management of high-risk elements as well as looking at some newer capabilities that this customer was instrumental in helping us design. There is a chance that you might want more information. There's a chance that you might want to see Secrets Hub. We're here, of course, right? We're sponsoring a session, so we're sponsoring the event. So please come by and see us. This totally safe, I promise. I feel like if there are security people, they're like, nah, I'm not gonna scan it. It's QR code. Simply takes you to a point of, with more information around, around Secrets Hub. It is something that, while I mentioned that we have announced, it is available in early access. So we are looking for design partners. So if you utilize Cyborg, or even if you don't, and this is compelling to you, we are more than happy to, to hook in, understand the requirements, and give you hands-on previews of this, as long as you're happy to give us feedback and let us know that we're on the right track. So this is something that CyberArk is doing with every single new service that it creates. Uh, Secrets Hub is simply the newest service we're doing it with. Uh, I mentioned earlier the utilization of open source, particularly around the secrets management side of things. If there's not a project, as an example, if you want to take advantage of Summon or Secretless, this customer uh, actually really loves the idea of Summon, then you can find them there on the GitHub. As I said, come by, yell at us. Uh, we've got t-shirts, but I think Secrets Hub might be the thing you want to look at, but come by, see us. If you've got deeper, deeper questions, you want to take a look at it, but, if you've got not so deeper questions that aren't related to seeing the tech in action, whether it's about the customer, their drivers, their pain points, any elements of the story, I think we've got some time, so I will ask what questions you have for me. Or even pieces of good advice that you've gone through in your migrations that it makes sense for us to uplift while we have a little bit of time in the Q&A section. Any thoughts, questions, grievances are also more than welcome. Anything like that. I don't see any, I'm not, okay, good deal. If you do think of one, come on by and see us. We're here, we're at booth uh, 204, but on behalf of myself, on behalf of the AWS teams who worked with us to sort of build uh, these newer services as well as to enable this particular customer and the customer themselves who couldn't be here, thank you so much for, for taking the time. Um, if you do have those questions, let us know. Otherwise, you can reach out to me directly at that email address. Uh, I accept all memes, funny cat videos. I click on every single link you send me as a good lesson to CyberArk InfoSec, but please, please do reach out. But thank you all so, so much again for taking the time.